right, welcome back, everybody. This is Derek Kirby from the Dallas Prospect, joined today by my dude, Big Game James, ready to talk some Mavericks playoff basketball. James, how are you doing, man? Man, I'm just chilling, big dog. You know what I'm saying? Just getting ready, excited that our Mavs made the uh, playoffs first time since 2016. Yep. Um, and hopefully this will be another long streak that the Mavericks had for a while going. So let's start the streak again this year. Yeah, uh, it's it's an interesting setup for sure. It's I think it's the first, what, playoff run. I mean, obviously, this is the first run in forever without Dirk here. But I'm mm -hmm. trying to remember what the last playoff year in the 90s was before Dirk came in. I mean, it wasn't – it's got to be like the early 90s, right? Early 90s, like yeah. late 80s, late 80s, early 90s, because uh, that's when the Derek Harpers and the Rolando Blackmans were just fading out and things of that nail, yep. nature. Yeah, and the 90s were a very dark decade for the Mavericks. So, man. <laughs> yeah. Interesting there. Just that kind of footnote. It kind of adds just a touch of solemn to it, but, you know, whatever. But the it, crazy thing is, Mavs always had talent. You know what I mean? Yeah. When you, even when you look at the dark days, Mavs, it's never been a thing of short of talent. It's just been kind of the ownership was kind of maybe lacking. And you seem, like I said, Cuban came and kind of uh, changed, changed the culture and changed the mindset. And I think that has helped. Uh, sometimes I think he gets in it too much, uh, but at the end of the day, I love his passion and what he's brought to the table since he took over with the Mavericks, and he's always trying to win. You know what I'm saying? He's always trying to build a winner, so that's what makes me excited about the Mavs um, from here and from since he took over and from here and beyond. Yeah, for sure. And like you said, this is hopefully the start of a new string now with the return to the playoffs, a new streak of playoff appearances. We did just see the Spurs' historic 22-year run come to an end. I read somewhere that it's the first time they've missed the playoffs since Popovich was the interim head coach there, and they That's won the crazy. lottery and drafted Tim Duncan. <laughs> 22 seasons. Yep, and it took That's, a tiebreaker to push him out. Like, it, it right. was still that close. I thought they were dead in the water uh, right before the season suspended. I was like, ah, oh, there's no way. They're, they're cooked. And the fact that they got right to the cusp of it, along with the Suns, was pretty, pretty incredible, I thought. But, yeah. yeah that's what they, they mean. Coaching matters. Yep. And it just shows, like, even with all the turnover they had, even with losing Kawhi Leonard, one, they still made the playoffs last year, and two, they were right at the doorstep again this year. So, mm -hmm. yeah, coaching is everything in that regard. And, you know, you can get a lot out of it. And that's, that's kind of what I'm hoping to see from Carlisle because if the Mavericks are going to have any damn shot in this in this matchup here with the Clippers in this first round, he's going to have to basically be a wizard as far as some of these strategies and lineups and everything he uses. We've seen him do it before, but I don't know that he's ever, I don't know that his team has ever been this overwhelmingly overmatched as far as like the matchup, as far as like, you know, just the physical tools and the talent disparity. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I totally agree with you with that. Um, it's really going to have to be one of them situations where he's a, a coach of the year in the series. Mm -hmm. uh, because as you said, he's got to figure out the right matchups, what guys to bring off the bench. You know what I'm saying? Look at the time frames when, you know, when these subs need to come in, because uh, we've seen games in this bubble where we, I've been kind of bewildered at some of the matchup changes or yeah. some of the guy he has sitting on the bench and not even playing. And, and I'm just under, not understanding. And then it, it just, kind of just compounds defensively because um, I think Rick Carlisle is a good defensive coach, but sometimes when we I watch it on the team and I don't see it and I just see these defensive breakdowns, that's just frustrating. And it's like you can't have those, especially when you're playing against a Clipper team that just brought over um, a, a Kawhi Leonard and, and they're looking to win a championship this year. Yeah, I mean, the, the Clippers are right there. I think they've got to be – if not the absolute favorite, certainly in the top two, at worst top three, if you're looking at it that way. I think they're better than the Bucks. I think it's them or the Lakers, essentially. It's it's a really difficult matchup, not just because the Mavericks were 0-4 against them in the regular season, not just because they lost by an average of 12 points, really only had one game decided by single digits, that being a three-point loss in mid to late January. But it's just the fact that this team has so much length and athleticism. It kind of lets them be physical with Luka. They can bother Luka a little bit more than some of these other teams. Now, the Bucks, they got physical with Luka on the perimeter, and he actually played, I think, the game of his life thus far. 
in that, mm-hmm. where he kind of rose up. You saw him fighting through that contact, driving, still relentlessly attacking the basket, and dishing out with pinpoint passes to spot up three point shooters. Like Dorian Finney Smith's huge game was that game, the 27 points. Luka's going to have to do a lot of that, only I think he's going to have to do that against, while the Bucks are the number one defense this year, I think it's going to be a little bit tougher in this regard because I don't think the Bucks have any one guy perimeter-wise who can be locked down, and the Clippers, both of their superstars, have that distinction. Right, and and one thing we know about Porzingis, uh, and, uh, Porzingis is, and you've seen him up close, is, I mean, he has that length like no other. Uh-huh. And, and, he, and he will get in there at times, but he's just not the biggest dude in the world. Yeah. And when you, you can't body him, you can't get physical with him. And I think that's what the Clippers are going to try to do to negate his height. Uh, because once he gets uh, around that basket at that length, it's, you know, it's easier for him to get those shots. Uh, but I, I know when teams start really getting physical with him, putting up bodies on him, um, he tends to start pushing them out more in the perimeter. He tends to wear down physically quicker. And then it kind of suffers on the defensive end for him. Um, so that's what a little bit I'm concerned about um, what 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 they're going to do to help Luca, because yeah. I think that's I mean, not Luca. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, um, KP, what are they going to do to help KP? Because we know Lu- what Luca's going to bring to the table. But I think KP needs more help on that inside to kind of free him and let him do his thing when he has to go in there and bang and then come out and play defense. It, it just tends to you see him just pushing more and more out on the perimeter. He starts selling him for the jump shots. Yeah. And, you know, it It kind of just depends on what's working for him in that regard. Because of the Clippers being more physical inside, yes, that does push him outside. But if it is a game like we saw with the Blazers game the other day, right. where he's raining down three, seven for nine on threes and 36 points in 36 minutes, I mean, yeah, if he's having that kind of performance, then you got to go to him more. And in that particular game, the Blazers game, he had 16 in the first quarter, 14 in the third quarter, and then six the rest of the way, zero in the second quarter. And I know I, I don't have a problem with him coming out like he did uh, late in the first quarter. That's his like scheduled rest. But I felt like the Mavericks didn't do a good job at all going back to the scorching hot guy at that mm-hmm. point. And yeah, the Blazers threw a, a zone defense at him to kind of change up the defensive look and it threw the Mavericks a little bit off kilter. But I think you have to figure out Who's really abusing their their opponent? Who's really the matchup nightmare for the opposing defense? And you got to stick to that. Whether it's Luka tearing it up or whether it's KP, I think the Mavericks have shown a frustrating uh, tendency to kind of drift away from something. Like they'll, they'll do it for a while and then they're like, "All right, great. Now what?" Well, no, not now. What? They haven't stopped you yet. Keep doing it. Well, so, that's when Tim Hardaway Jr. takes two or three dumb shots, and then that's how it messes a whole whole realm of things up <laughs> when he comes down. Yeah. And uh, Luca is killing it with two or three in a row, and he passes it to him right quick, and he shoots a three out of nowhere. That 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 kind of stuff be frustrating me from Hardaway Jr. But another thing with KP, I wish they would just continue to start with him inside out. Let him mm-hmm. get a couple of them good inside shots. Let him get that kind of motion going. Where And then his threes in his perimeter game seems to just kind of really open up. Let him get an inside. Let him work while he's fresh. Get in there. Don't don't try to work him out when he starts getting tired. You know what I mean? Let's yeah. get in him and when he's fresh. Because like I said, we really don't have that offensive inside presence. Let him work a little bit on the inside and then ins- inside out with him. Because I like that. KP's got that jump shot but I like when he can get the quick jump hook or can score a couple inside moves then you start seeing his game really going to me yeah and they've done a little bit better job in the bubble of establishing him the first few possessions on the block giving him a turnaround jumper down low and you know I I think it's it's fine to to do that a little bit more for sure but I also think that because of the physicality inside while you want to establish that I think it's a balancing act because there have been a couple times this year where it almost seemed like they were stubbornly trying to do that a little bit. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. it's we're talking early in the game, but with the Clippers, you don't want to fall behind big early on. Like in, mm-hmm. in these four losses this year, I think three of them were pretty close for most of the game before they kind of fell apart towards the end. This last example being a 101-101 tie with about six minutes left before the Clippers pull away and suddenly it's 126-111, which is mm-hmm. crazy to give up. Uh, that many points in the final six minutes but it's it's just a matter of you got to hang tight with this team you cannot let them knock you down on the mat and basically put their foot on your chest before you even really 
find anything going. Because then you're expending all of your, yes, you're the number one offense in the league. And yes, when your role players actually show up and shoot, Tim Hardaway has been shooting close to 40% this year. Seth Curry shooting 45% through a thousand career three-point attempts. He is the second um, highest percentage ever behind only Steve Kerr through the first thousand threes of their career. That's great when they're there. But in the case of Curry, he's been very much, very much feast or famine. Like he'll he'll give you 14 to 18 points, and then he'll follow it up with two points on 0 of 4 shooting. Like it, it's it's difficult to build around that in the starting lineup. And Hardaway Jr. for parts of this year, he's been there as the number three guy, and other times he just hasn't been. He hasn't looked like he's filled that role. And so that that's going to be a thing for the Mavericks. Can they basically avoid the slow start? Because that I think that puts them in a really bad spot. If they, for such a young, inexperienced team, like playoff experience, you got Berea, but who else do you really have on this team that has been here and done this before? It, right. It's a difficult spot for a young team to go against a very championship-ready veteran team in the Clippers, I think. Uh, that's a great point. It's, I think the biggest point that you just made was that the the inexperience mm-hmm. going into the NBA playoffs um, and the experience coming on the other side. You got Paul George, who's been around. You got Kawhi Leonard. They both played in big playoff games. Yeah. Um, I mean, even Patrick Beverly, I don't know. I know he's got the calf injury, uh, but they have playoff ready experience. And that's the reason why they got it, because they're trying to win now. You know what I mean? Um, so that's that's going to be uh, something that the uh, Mavericks are going to have to keep their eye on. Um, I think just something that just really frustrates me is how Dwight Powell uh, got hurt with that Achilles. I think, man, he would have really, uh, really helped out right now, especially with this bubble. Mm-hmm. And then Willie Cauley-Stein opting out, I, I get it. But that was, uh, to me, real frustrating, especially when you brought him over. Uh, for a particular reason to get you over into the playoffs to be able to use that size and to lose that and to do a trade off with Trey Burke, although Trey Burke had a big game. Burke's been that's very get- good, yeah. Yeah, I mean, but you're still missing a seven footer. <laughs> sure. That's uh, athletic that can really, you know, like I said, help KP. So my thing is, I'm really just going to really look at this inside game because I've seen too many games where the Mavericks start staying out on the perimeter. It'll be one shot. Uh, three pointer. Everybody's staying out there, and then once the team gets the the rebound, they're taking it coast to coast. They're lacking on defense, and they're just reaching for the ball. And the next thing you know, a two point game is a ten point lead. Yep. And then we got to rely on Luca taking it. You know what I'm saying? And it becomes a not a good story, and we cannot afford to get behind. Yeah. No, I I agree wholeheartedly on that. Uh, I think there is some vulnerability with the Clippers right now. I don't know the the latest on Harrell. You mentioned yeah, Patrick Beverly is dealing with a, a bit of a nick up and an injury. Lou Williams hasn't quite looked 100% yet. And so there is some vulnerability. You're talking about two bench scorers in that that I just listed off there who have averaged 18 points. They're both in the six-man-of-the-year finalist consideration along with OKC's Dennis Schroeder. So there there is definitely advantage there. But, you know, in your 126-111 loss to them a, a few days ago, they didn't have Harold then. They had the same right. general weaknesses, and it didn't mm-hmm. really matter. So, the the Clippers, they're they're not defensively rated where like for the season where I necessarily would have expected them. Like, like they're top ten, but they're not as high up as I anticipated seeing them. But mm-hmm. I think the difference is kind of like uh, with like LeBron James, for instance. I know that's talking about a Lakers guy now, but kind of like how we talked before about like his teams in the regular season versus playoffs and they flip a switch. We've kind of seen that as well. And I think the Clippers, especially being a veteran team, you just have too many good defenders on that team and too many guys that can cause problems that I think that odds are they're going to kind of find that next gear. Even if it's not instantaneous, the odds Mm -hmm. are they're probably going to find that next gear. And then it's going to be a matter for the Mavericks of, okay, can you shoot the lights out? Because you're going to have to have exceptional outside shooting if you're going to be able to hang in this series because with the physicality they're going to bring on crashing the boards, on defending, on fighting over screens and things like that, you're going to have some difficulty really getting into the flow and rhythm of what you want. And part of that just comes with the growing experience as well for this Mavericks team. We talked about the lack of experience. When you're actually in a series, be it 
one or two weeks long, depending on how long it goes. When you're in a series against a team who is doing nothing but studying tape of every single thing you like to do and everything that exposes you, and then they're relentlessly attacking you based on those things, that's a moment where you grow. That's something where you have to adjust to suddenly being denied in a way that a regular season matchup can't prepare or doesn't prepare near as in-depth for that and then abuse what your weaknesses are in that way. Yeah, I mean, I, I totally feel you about the the defensive makeup is thinking that you they would be a highly rated defense um, pretty much during the year, mm-hmm. uh, considering the players that they have. But as you said before, the NBA is a long season, and you see a lot of these veteran teams uh, with veteran coaches they don't. I'm not saying they coast, but they pace themselves. The, the the Chicago Bulls, when they were winning those championships, the the older you get, you pace yourself. Maybe mm-hmm. I'm not saying you give up on a game, but they pace themselves. You know, they they know when okay, it's getting closer to the end of the year. Now it's time to really turn it up. So uh, they were still kind of the Clippers were still kind of learning themselves. I feel like as well. Um, so now, like you said, this is it. Um, they're trying to get a championship. So now I feel like it's going to be a lot more aggressiveness. I feel like there's going to be the the hedging, the the aggressiveness. They, uh, you know, I feel like they were, it's going to be good if pa- Patrick Beverly can be out a couple games because he's yeah. just a pest, you know what I mean? And that's one less uh, pest that they have to deal with defensively, especially Luka, because yeah. I feel like they would just try to, you know, tire him down uh, because he's so ball dominant, you know what I mean? Um, I, I think guys are getting healthy, um, that we need uh, Gil, uh, Michael Kill Gil, Gilchrist. Mm-hmm. Um, I think he played the last game. Um, I, I know he's not really an offensive threat. We know about that ugly jump shot he has. Yeah, but that's another player that is a perimeter player, a wing player that can help a, de- a defend a Paul George. Uh, right. Can to help defend a Kawhi Leonard. That's what they're going to need, and that's when we're talking about Rick Carlisle having. Uh, be able to make the right matchups, the right substitutions, um, be able to put the right people on those people that you need to. So um, getting Gilchrist back is is going to be is good. I think uh, the Justin Jackson, I believe he just played as well. I like his game. Um, so we're just going to see how these matchups, like you said, with Greg Carlisle is going to be a real keen and how he puts people and who figures up on the lineup best. And as you said before, if Luca's hot and hitting two or three in a row, let that man keep going and, and, and keep firing off until they stop that. If we yeah. got a killing, if we killing them on a pick and roll every play, let's go on that pick and roll until they stop it. Yeah, I mean, with with uh, the Mavericks defense isn't really going to be the thing. I know people have been wanting to see, and I understand going into the the restart and everything. Rick Carlisle kept preaching, preaching, preaching on defense. And you just really haven't seen it consistently. Like, Luka's stepped up his game a bit defensively, which has been nice to see. But the Mavericks as a team have not stepped up. I I think the fewest points they gave up in any game in the restart was legitimately like 117. Like, it's been that bad defensively. And the thing is, it's the number one rated offense. It's the efficiently, in terms of points per 100 possessions, the most efficient offense in NBA history ahead of the Kevin Durant, Steph Warriors. So, yeah, you look at things like that, and it's like, okay, there's something here to it. We need to just lean on the offense more. We need to, like, fix that. Yes, you want to get defensive stops, but I think the notion of, well, we're going to make a drastic turnaround in this where we suddenly are holding them to the low hundreds or something like that, especially against this team, I think is going to be difficult. But you do have guys, and I think it's important to use them, like you said, Michael Kidd Gilchrist. I'd actually like to see him take some minutes from Justin Jackson And we've seen kind of signs of that. Like two games ago, um, I believe it was, Kit Gilchrist had, uh, he was like a plus 21 or something like that in the game. The man took no shots. (laughs) Like he he had a big impact and it wasn't a plus 21. That's, That's not right. As I say that now, I'm thinking that sounds outlandish even to my thinking. But uh, he had a a strong plus minus. He took no shots in the game. And he just played good, um, good quality minutes. Conversely, Justin Jackson, he's got a great floater game, but he seems like he's been struggling for some time. He hasn't really found his rhythm. He had, I think, one good game in the restart. And when he was playing against the Blazers, he only had eight minutes, and Carmelo was abusing him on the block. He missed a couple layups point blank as well. And so, like, I, I think in that case... You need to, because it's so important to find value out of the back end of the bench, I think you have to move him. Um, You have to give some of his minutes, at least, 
to a guy who can at the very least play hard-nosed, versatile defense, guard several different guys for you if you have to do that, especially with a team that can throw so many different guys at you at a given time. But to the point you were saying then about um, Luka and attacking relentlessly, he needs to keep attacking the basket. Like, do it in the pick and roll, do it however. But Luka, when you get him within like that restricted area, he's shooting like nearly 70%, I think, this year. And he leads the NBA, I believe, and completed and once he has the size and the strength to get to the rim and finish and we're talking about a guy that's shooting like 31 percent from three this year it's right. not really been consistent for him yes we love the step back and it looks pretty as hell but even if he hits a couple early on i think he has a tendency to kind of whether it's from a point of exhaustion or whatever i think he has a tendency to rely on it a little too much if he's already hit a couple and I think he just needs to stay aggressive, stay dialed in and attacking the basket like he was all throughout that Bucks game. And then you just control it just by drive and kick. So yeah. we'll, we'll think, see what uh, can come of that. Um, but bouncing off what you just said, though, I feel like he is tired. I mean, you got to look, he's playing heavy minutes. He's playing that guard position. Mm -hmm. I mean, you play the game and you're going to the hole constantly. Um, and you're getting rebounds. People need to understand. I mean, he's getting, what, eight, nine rebounds a game. So he's yeah, in the there getting, getting oh, eleven, right? So you're you're getting you're he's killing on the defensive rebounds. So when you do, what do you do when you're defensive rebounding, offensive rebounding? That takes energy. Yeah. Um. And so he's one of our major rebounders on the squad right now. Number you feel one. me? <laughs> so, I mean, what it's I feel like what it is DDP as well. Like I said, maybe he relies on that jump shot because he's tired, man. Mm -hmm. You got to get rebounds, you addition, you're going to the hole that, and then you got to play some defense. I mean, after a while going to the hole every single time. And it's not like those are some easy shots that he's taking. And it's not like guys are not getting physical when he's going to the hole that wears on you. You continue to um, go to the hole. You know what? I'm going to start shooting that jump shot. You know what I mean? And if yeah. you, that jump shot a few times, maybe you kind of want to go to the hole, but I feel like he's just, he needs some help off the bench. We need a guard like a, the Brunson, because um, I like a Trey Burke, but we don't have that creating point guard that can really get the flow of the offense um, together, and I think that's why he plays them extended minutes. Yeah, I think Burke has actually been a, a great addition for the Mavericks in the bubble, because he is right now, at least for the time being, serving well on that secondary ball handler role. Now, he's not like a by any means a guy that you would start typically, but I think for now, he's really fit well with what they need. I think they are much better off having picked him up. Um, and, and at the time when they signed him before the bubble, I was kind of like, all right, he was here at the end of last year. He came over in the KP trade. So I guess they thought it was like some familiarity and that might kind of help as far as the playoffs and him being able to do some kind of role. He's been great. I mean, the, the Houston game, yeah, that was 31 points and I think six threes. He was fantastic in that game. But he's been very steady-handed and a good presence, I think, for the backcourt. That has allowed Luka to be a little bit, at times, more rested or off the ball, just whatever, kind of holding that down. Whether or not he can continue to have that impact against, like, a, a Patrick Beverly, I don't know. You know, as far as who he's going to match up with on the Clippers, that might be... A lot more to ask of him for a guy that has floated around quite a bit in his career but mm -hmm. you know it, it's it's just a matter of what you said earlier the x's and o's how can carlisle shake things up because you will have to get a little bit creative with this you can't just go straight forward i mean you got uh, you also mentioned willie collie stein being out dwight powell being out you're going to have to be a little bit more creative because you're limited in front court bodies essentially that you can throw out there you've got maxi you've got kp i love maxi yeah I, I love him too he, he's been great for us um mm -hmm. you got him you got kp and you got bobon basically anchoring down the center position that's right. not a lot of depth there especially when bobon doesn't typically get big minutes unless it's a game like that phoenix game which will otherwise not be mentioned because of how terrible it was <laughs> but exactly. uh unless it's a game like that he just doesn't get heavy minutes and so suddenly three bodies is almost like two and a half bodies and so yeah, you can run for, uh, Dorian Finney-Smith down at the four when you need to, but you really have to get creative with how you set things up, and that will involve KP playing a little bit inside and out. Yeah, well, uh, come on, Mavericks. Because <laughs> we, 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 you know, like I said, 
Um, I, I don't have any expectations with this playoff team. Not saying we're I'm coming in for us to lose. I don't have any expectations. Mm-hmm. I just, like I said, I really want to see what Carlisle's going to do. Yeah. I kind of, I know what the team, I, I, I kind of, we have a pulse of how the team's out, but I want to see what Carlisle, Carlisle, what you going to do this year? What you going to do with this matchup that everybody's saying is such a David Goliath? Show me that coaching magic. OK, yeah. because he got that one title. Um, they've been to the playoffs, but the magic kind of wore off a little bit with Carlisle to me at times. So now, Carlisle, you got to show some of that good coaching stuff. And this is the perfect team to show it against to show what your coaching is made of. Yeah. I mean, I also think like I- I've had issues, certainly with Carlisle, whether it's been substitutions he's made at times, whether it's been um, just how he distributes minutes. Right. Like we talked about even in that first Houston game. You had uh, Trey Burke just going off, and he wasn't playing him in the clutch. He was instead playing, who was it he was playing in his place? It was a guy that didn't make any sense. Oh, it was Curry. It was Seth Curry who had two points in the game. I mean, it was like, dude, why'd you take out the guy average, or not averaging, but with 28 points and six threes in favor of Curry here? I know Curry's career three-point percentage, but he's done nothing in this game. Like, he'll have moments like that, Carlisle will, that I'll get frustrated. I'm like, this seems completely counter to what the team needs right now. But I also tend to give him a little bit of slack as, as it pertains to a bigger picture of recent years because we've not given him a lot of talent, right? How many times did we chase big fishes in the free agency period strike out and then have to scramble to assemble a team that would it, it kind of works out for the worst right we've largely scrambled to put together teams that are not quite good enough for the playoffs but certainly not close enough to the lottery although the last two years being 24 and 33 wins respectively opened that up for you and good thing they did because look you finally had two down down years and what do you get out of it you get dennis smith and you get Luca, and then you flip Dennis Smith for KP. So it's, uh, I, I give him a little bit of leeway there because now, oh, look, he suddenly has the talent and the team has now stepped back into the playoffs. But yes, it's been a while since the Mavericks have done anything. They've not won a playoff series since the championship. I think they've won a total of four games in the playoffs since the championship, no less. They got swept the next year by OKC. They, in 2016, then won a game against OKC, had a year where they won a game against Houston. Oh, right, but they had three against the uh, Spurs that year where they went to seven in 2014, which I actually think was Carlisle's best postseason. Like, in, in terms of a single series, I think that might have been his best uh, stroke of genius there, how they took on that Kawhi Leonard Spurs team that went on to win the championship and no one ever challenged them the way that right. the Mavericks did in that first round. Right. Yeah, well, like I said, it's it's going to have to be some more of that magic uh, this year. Yep. Um, that if you're talking about that that 2014, sprinkle that in 2020, big dog. Sprinkle that, sprinkle me, baby, sprinkle it all right now, because we're going to need. And here's the thing: I don't think it's such uh, this Clippers team is a such a Goliath. You just have to really be good on these matchups. Um, you have to really have to really coach your ass off because even though yes, they are they have a good team, they have size, they have athleticism, they have the length, but they can be beat. Sure. So at the end of the day, that's what we're gonna look at. Um, it'd be tough seven game series starting out with them guys, but uh, man, like I said, we'll see. Come on, Gil Chris, I need some of that good defense <laughs> that you've been. Uh, <laughs> I yeah. need some good defense from you, Gil Chris. Yeah. That's why they got you. Yep. I think uh, I, th- I think this is going to be a really tough series for the Mavericks, and to expect them to, if they could push it to six, even I would be ecstatic with that. But I also caution uh, Mavs fans as well because I, I know that we're all kind of like um, captive to the moment, so to speak. Like we see how good this team has been this year. How at one point they were the two seed, and how if you think like, hey, if we had had a healthy Luca and KP this whole year and not had KP, I think, missed like 15 games right. um, or 16, something like that. And then Luca missed double-digit games at one point because of various ankle injuries. Had had we had them the whole season, we could be in the top four seeds and have home court advantage instead. And so people see that, and they say like, oh, well, therefore, if we don't at least push six, seven games against this favorite or more even get past them in the first round, well, then it's a, it's a failure. I don't think that at all. 
because yeah, no. I, as, as I talked about the other day, before the season started, I predicted this would be a 44-win team. They, By the way, they won 43, so I was scary on on that, especially. But to be fair, had there not been the uh, season suspended and you had actually played 82 games, they would have surpassed what I had. They would have gotten 50 wins at least. But um, I had them at 44 wins, and I said they were going to need, at the trade deadline, another significant move to give a third true score. And that if they, if they did that, I had them then getting the seven seed. Well, they didn't make the trade, but they did get the seven seed. So I feel like two out of three is not bad. But no, no <laughs> uh, he was real good on that, for real, for real. Yeah. Um, but uh, that that third score, you know, like I said, it, we need we need Tim Hardaway Jr. He needs to play. He needs to play lights out in this first round. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, like he needs to play. He needs to play lights out, and he has to shoot good. And shots have to be – they have to be within the flow. I know – you know what I'm saying? I, I I can't remember what game we was watching. I think we was playing Phoenix the first time. Uh, and I think that was the game where he was like 0 for 11 or uh, from, from the three-point range and that gave him the last shot and he missed it. Um, just some of them shots that he was taking in the game, it's just like uh, we had a, a – a Dallas was on a run and then he comes out of nowhere and takes this ill-advised three. Yeah. It's like we we can't have those in this in this this series. And when you are making these, um, when you are shooting, it's going to have to be a higher percentage than a forty percent or forty one percent. He's got to shoot over like a 46 percent clip in this series uh, for the Mavericks to have a chance as well. Yeah, and another guy that could have a big impact here that the Mavericks need a big series out of, who's been sensational in the bubble, has been Dorian Finney Smith. I mean, we obviously know of his twenty seven point game against the Bucks, but he's had other games of, I think his low end is 12, but he's had like 16, 18. He's been very, very good for the Mavericks. He's shooting a much better percentage on threes, particularly those corner threes. I still maintain uh, he got robbed of a potential game winner against the Blazers there on that uh, charge call. But, you know, it, it's one of those things too. Well, I mean, let's be honest, Dame being Dame, if he'd had 0.5 seconds, he's knocking down a three to win it anyway. But, uh, I think Dorian Finney-Smith, you need a big series out of him because he's one of the few quality defenders, versatile defenders, you can really throw at people. And so you're going to need him to do just enough to slow him down. Like, he, he was really good, actually, against Giannis in that Bucks game. Uh, mm-hmm. Only committed three fouls. Giannis attempts seven threes in that game. And, you know, even when he gets to the line, then he's 7 of 14. He's not a great free throw shooter or a three-point shooter. But still, you force him into areas they're not necessarily comfortable and you try to minimize your own fouls in that case. If he can do that and knock down, a, you know, three threes a game, we're talking if he can be like double digit score, basically anything more than that is absolute gravy. But I like as well that you've seen some aggressiveness from him as he's found that outside shot. Mm-hmm. Teams have started closing out on him more. He's attacking the basket. That's what we need him to do. Attack that basket and be aggressive. Because like you said, he's been a godsend um, during this period of time. And he's got good length. He's a good athletic type forward. Uh, But yeah, we're definitely going to, he hits a few of those jump shots, get aggressive and go to the hole and put pressure on that defense. Yes, absolutely. That'll, that'll be a big uh, deciding factor in this game. Because when Dwight Powell went out, it's a complicated trade-off here, right? Because Dwight Powell being an elite rim runner and lob threat, uh, made the Mavericks offense almost impossible to guard because you have so many guys who are shooting career best marks from the three-point line. Yeah, Curry shooting 45%, um, Hardaway shooting, I think he's just under 40% now, but he was shooting 40% going into the bubble. Um, Maxi Kleba was like 36, 37%. Dorian Finney-Smith at one point this year was 39%. I think he's hovering around 37 and a half right now. So you have guys like that who are shooting great for the Mavericks. You have Luka, a, a absolute maestro, who can find guys with precision passes on the driving kick. And then KP and Luka both who can stretch the floor and have just a certain gravity about their presence. It opens things up. So when you then dropped in a, an elite lob threat there, it was almost impossible for defenses to guard. The catch-22 of that is KP didn't emerge consistently. Like, if you look at KP since the Dwight Powell injury, when KP stopped being the four, basically, and started being the five, Mm -hmm. that was the major turning point for him this season. That was when you started seeing him explode out of the gates. Like, he's averaging about 20 points, a little over 20 points per game this year. Obviously, in the bubble, he's averaged um, over 30. Like, he's taking it to even another level now. 
But that that's where you're like, you know, you miss the Dwight Powell presence, but KP's real emergence to the point where he's in full unicorn mode didn't really come about until um, until he stepped into that role. And so the Mavericks are going to have to figure out how to balance that and then, you know, how to manage that, like I said earlier in this case, with limited front court depth. Yeah. Um, when, you, when you said he switched to the five, because think about it, you don't see a lot of athletic fives out there like KP. You mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? So like you said, it, it, it is, his numbers kind of went through the roof. Uh, because of that. that's why I like his game. It's an inside outside game, seven foot three, even though he's not a big guy, but he can take them centers out and bring them out and spray them three pointers. You come out there a little bit under three, he can give you a good pump fake because he's got enough dribbles and handles that he can take it to the hole and score on you. He and he has got more, um, more aggressive as far as you know, dunking on you. I've yep. seen a, a lot more times where he's taking it to the hole with the pump fake and he's trying to slam on people. That's the KP I want to see, yeah. For sure. And, you know, he, he's improved a lot as the season's gone on because of his 20-month layoff early on in the season. Uh, when you saw him drive to the basket, he was consistently getting ripped, just he wasn't dribbling low enough, basically. And you're 7'3", you're seven the ball's going to take a while to get back up to your hand. So he was getting ripped a lot. But he has drastically, drastically cut down on that to the point now where you I don't think you ever really see it anymore. So that's great. Um, he, he works best in that kind of mid range post thing. Cause he loves mm-hmm. just that turnaround jumper. He doesn't that turn around really... jumper is nice. I like that. How yeah. he's really developed that because that can be, that's a huge weapon DDP mm-hmm. uh, for him. So him continue to develop that, that part of his game. Like I said, that part of his game, cause I know he's got a good jump shot. He's got a good mid range. So that's why they call him the unicorn. You feel me? Because yeah. you can just do so many things at that size, but really continue to develop that little jump hook, man, because that is lethal. When he starts backing you down and get a couple steps and does that jump hook, man, that's unstoppable. That change that changes the whole a- a- facets and acid as um, aspects. I'm trying to get that word out aspects of his game, because now you don't know how you can really guard him and it opens up the flow for the Mavericks. Yeah. And you know, his, his, uh, money range or whatever you want to say in uh in new york was in that mid-range game just because obviously they hold over from like the triangle and stuff like that mavericks don't use that That, that's part of the thing modern nba the mid-range is almost treated like a dirty word essentially Mm -hmm. or Mm -hmm. you know it's taboo almost but having some ability in that space would be really nice i think like unless you're the spurs because of DeRozan, you really don't see a lot of the better teams act on that it's everything's a three or it's right at the rim and Mm -hmm. luca kind of falls uh prey to that as well where like i said he's a crazy efficient guy right around the basket but as you spread out and push to three point lines he's below average three-point shooter at this point in the nba he Mm -hmm. takes a high volume of them so like that that helps pump up the mavericks efficiency ratings as as those are calculated and uh balanced and all of that but I think if Luca, in particular could add even just a, a decent little aspect where he did it just a little bit of a mid-range game, I th- or even the floater, we've seen him do those, and he kind of got away from them as the season went on. But that would help extend things as well. And you got two guys there. If, if you got two guys you want to give that permission to, I think KP and Luca both have shown certainly the ability to do it. And I think that would be... I mean, honestly, like a tweak you can make to the offense that would kind of throw off maybe the Clipper game plan just a little bit if you're not just attacking like, oh, okay, they drove past the three-point line. Yeah, they're going to go all the way to the basket. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Make them defend everything, not just real close or out far. Right. Make the make we gotta make the Clippers work on defense. We can't make the Clippers have it easy. Like I said, we can't come down and just all the time something, you know, sometimes I see one one possession shot. That making it easy for the Clippers. We gotta wear them down too. And if they have injuries with Harold and he's not in the game, we gotta put the onus and put the pressure on them as well. And how you do that, you gotta get them tired. Don't make it easy for them by by bailing them out with easy quick shots and where they're not working on defense and then we don't maybe have the depth coming back on the other end. And at the end of the third and the fourth quarter, they tend to pull away. Like you were talking about a lot of the games that the Mavericks and Clippers played, even though uh, we were over and four against them, we were hanging tough, but eventually tends to wear down that third and fourth quarter. So we got to put the pressure on them early and often. Yeah. And you know that there's a couple things that really have plagued the Mavericks this season. Their greatest weaknesses have been 
the third quarter, a collapse in the third quarter where they do great in the first half and then come out flat in the third quarter and the other team pulls away and suddenly they're trying to play catch up. Or even when they have answered in the third quarter, the clutch. The Mavericks... <laughs> The Mavericks and the Clutch have been horrific this year. Right, they were rated, I think, 29th out of 30 teams uh, in the bu- like going into the bubble. Yeah, just games abysmal, away. abysmal. So it, it's bizarre how you compare that with the most efficient offense in NBA history from a points per hundred possessions um, perspective. It, it's crazy that you're in that situation, but a lot of it has to do with you know that's that's money time. And while Luca was fantastic in the Clutch as a rookie. Something about the Mavericks offense hasn't been right this year. And yes, Luca owns some share of that being the orchestrator of everything. But uh, Carlisle has to take some blame for that as well. The ball just doesn't seem to move enough. You have uh, the offense seem disjointed and suddenly you can't generate uh, high quality shots. You're not getting enough of them. That's why you have Luca settling for tough step backs and things like that in those moments because the other team battens things down. And the Clippers did that to us. The last time we played them, the Mavericks were right there, 101-101 with six minutes left, had all the momentum, it seemed. And then the Clippers were like, oh, okay, that's cute. Well, now we're going to really try on defense, and we're going to get more physical. And then they pulled away. You just saw the the whole dynamic shift. When you when you can play, play great and compete with anybody for three and a half quarters, you'll win a lot of games. You'll win 50 games a year. The, the championship teams are the teams that can really enforce and inflict their will in the final five, six minutes of a game. In 2011, that was the Mavericks. That was Dirk and them. You know, how many times were, were they down double digits in the final six, seven minutes of a game and then take over and come back to win? Not just the finals, but the West finals as well. So, and even at the LA in the second round that year. That's something this team has not figured out and they're going to have to figure that out. And a big part of that's going to come just from growth and development, understanding, um, getting this experience and understanding what these teams are going to try and do to take you out of your game and then how you can counteract that. Yeah. Well, like I said, KP, Luca, they're going to have to play lights out. Um, the, the team is going to guys going to have they gone this whole year. Um, so, you know, Luca said he's excited for his first playoff, you know, um, and I think he's really going to have a really good playoff. I think he's going to embrace it. I think he's going to embrace the challenge. Um, I, I love Luca's competitiveness, and the team feeds off that. So I think he's going to have to have one of them like career type series as a uh, first time um, playoff appearance for him. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, like I said, um, we'll 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 see how it goes. Um, yeah. The first game starts what in three days? Yeah, Monday night. Monday night. So uh, let's 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 get it. Let's get it, y'all. I mean, I'm I'm excited because I'm I want to. I want to make this competitive. You know, I don't want this to be one thing where this is like a false sweep and out. And it was just like, what? No, I, I like I said, um, we get to like six games, get a, a sneak a couple games in the, in there. Um, maybe sneak a, get a game. Uh, and, and here's the thing. Since we're playing in this bubble, the home court advantage, Means you, don't, you don't got that. So yep. this is what's going to help the Mavericks, in my opinion. Because remember, back in the day, you're thinking, oh, they got they got this top seed. And we're going to the Clipper land and all this. Nope, you're in the bubble. So yep. we can make this happen. That, that is true. That's a good point we have not called out with this being, you know, unprecedented NBA playoffs here. There is really no home court advantage. It means nothing. Like, it is basically a March Madness style setup here, except your fewer locations. But yeah, it, it's it's going to be substantial here for the Mavericks because as they you mentioned, it's they don't gain anything if they go to the playoffs and get swept away or something. You have to, like if you're going to really grow and actually evolve beyond that, you have to go in there and actually put up a fight. You have to show guts and grit that basically you, that's where you grow. If you go in there and just like hey, thanks for coming, Go now go back home, you know, then you don't really see them as easily taking a step than the following year. In 2001, the Mavericks kind of had that, where they, they beat the Jazz in the first round, the Stockton Malone Jazz, and then they went to a much favored Spurs after that, and I think they lost that series in five, I want to say. So, like, yes, that was a shorter series, but they hung tight, and they put up a fight, and then suddenly you flash forward two years after that, and they're in the Western Conference Finals, you know? So mm-hmm. you you have to show that ability to grow and keep advancing, and you don't want to be a team that just shows up and say, well, hey, 
and I don't think they are for the record, but a young team that shows up and say, Hey, we're, we're not, we're not favored here. We're just getting experience. You know, it's almost like we're just here and we're going to try and play and do our best, but you know how it goes, how it goes. It's not enough just to show up. You have to really lay it all out there and say, you're going to have to basically kill me to send me home. And if Mm -hmm. you do fine, but you're, you're getting everything I've got to offer. That's where this team can take a big step. And Luca and KP, it all anchors with them because it's not a one-two punch. It's a 1A, 1B type scenario at this point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I totally agree. And like I said, we're going to have to see them um, show that it doesn't make sense just to come in there and get swept. You got to show the reason why you made the playoffs and that you deserve to be there. And showing how you deserve to be there is uh, getting some dubs and some tough uh, victories against a quality team that's supposed to be – favorite to win a championship yep it kind of reminds me last point i'll make here it kind of reminds me of uh the 2010 thunder we're talking about a very young team anchored by two two young superstars harden was a rookie then so i don't count him in that Mm -hmm. equation yet going against a championship favored team from la in the first round and in that thunder's case of that team it was a 1-8 matchup not a two verse seven but you had to see them like they they took their lumps but in that series they they actually got it down to losing in six on a buzzer beater on a I think a Pau Gasol tip in at the buzzer to lose game six. So mm-hmm. you've got to show that kind of that kind of fight and heart in the game if you're going to do it. It's not enough just to get there. But I do see some parallels for sure there. And I, I'm trying to remember who initially made that observation. It might have been Dalton Trigg maybe on uh, on Twitter. But I saw mm-hmm. someone mention that, and the more I thought about it, you know, being that I'm from OKC and the Thunder is kind of a team I follow as well, I was like, you know, that that's not a bad observation at all. There are parallels there, but right. yeah, we'll we'll see. My my gut feeling is this is going to be a one round thing for the for the Mavericks. I don't think there's much chance for them to pull out any kind of magic to get past them. Is it possible? Yes, just because these are. Like we said, it's an unprecedented scenario. Suddenly home court advantage means nothing. But I imagine this is going to be a a really hard fought five, hopefully six game series. Yeah, I, I hope so too. If we can if we can, like I said, we can get six games out of this. Um I'm feeling I'm feeling great for the future. Um, as you said, you know, I love I love the team. I love how they developed um in these couple of years with Luca and then getting KP, um, getting to the playoffs has been a great uh what, what quote unquote feel good story. Yeah. Um, but you know, at the end of the day, they need to show competitiveness and they need to show that they do belong in these playoffs. I don't think, as you said, that they, uh, this is going to be more than one round, but if it is going to be one round, let's make this a productive hard fought, uh, series so people can uh, understand and know from the future and beyond that the Mavericks are here and they're here to stay. Absolutely. Well, we'll definitely be doing a lot of post-game shows, I imagine, throughout the playoffs for this, especially. For sure. Yeah, especially if it uh, is a one-round thing. No no issue there at all uh, with that. <laughs> so, yeah, we'll uh, we'll do more of these. We'll do we'll do these live for post-game shows because if you get the video out the same night, let alone within, like, uh, the hour of the game ending, there's a lot more engagement and a lot more going on with that versus if you record it or something and then put it out the following morning, it's like a third of the views if you do that. Right. So right. we'll try to go live. We'll keep engaged here uh, with everyone and talk it out. But for now, we just wanted to do a kind of preview to this now with the regular season over. And now we are going into uncharted territory. Yes, sir. Let's get it. Yep. Uh, James, tell them real quick where they can find you. Uh, you can check me out, Silver and Blue Nation, Big Game James. Uh, just type that silver, the and that little and symbol, Blue Nation. Um, do a lot of Cowboys football, mainly Cowboys football, but I've uh, been working with my dog, DDP, the last few seasons uh, to get that basketball game up. I do, I play basketball, do all that anyway. Um, but just trying to open up more broader doors and just not always be Cowboys football. They just have some more uh, things for people to talk about. So, uh, definitely getting excited for this season. They had some practice today. I posted some pictures earlier. C.D. Lamb, your dog from Oklahoma, yep. I heard had a really na- nice 
nasty one-handed catch that I got a picture of. So I heard he's already turning up um, already. So, hey, check out the page. We go live. I think I'm doing a live tonight with a guy named Rudy Reyes. Um, he does uh, Pittsburgh Steelers football, and that's going to be a good um, back and forth because we mm-hmm. played the Steelers this year. Um, so, you know, hey, just check us out. We like to have fun and, and, and kick it. And, uh, you know, we just try to keep it real over there. You know how we do, DDP. Yes, sir. All right. Well, James, thanks for coming on. And uh, for everyone else, if you haven't already, drop a like for this video, leave a comment below, subscribe to the Dallas Prospect. And until next time, remember, every legend was once a prospect. Peace. Peace.